Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's really important. I'll have plenty of time afterwards to answer questions um, if you have any. So if you raise your hand and I ignore you, it's not because I'm a jerk. It's because they don't want me to answer questions during the presentation. So um, yeah, tomorrow, if you want to meet up with, with Rick and I at 11 AM, we'll be in this space. And we'll talk about the tools that we use and uh, kind of some of the places that we're going to go and the techniques that we might use to capture images while we're out. And then we'll hit the streets. And we'll stop somewhere for lunch along the way. And we'll plan to wrap up by 1 or 2 o'clock, probably depending on how fancy our lunch is, I guess. So uh, thank you for coming. So I'm sponsored by Panasonic. I'm, I'm one of the uh, Lumix luminaries. And this is called Traveling Light. But this is not a commercial for selling all of your Canon gear and, or your Nikon gear and buying a, a Lumix camera. Um, I'll explain to you why I did that and why it works for a lot of people. But um, this is about more than just your camera choice. This is about um, how to choose the gear that you do carry, because everybody's going to carry a lot of stuff, right? We, we all want to make great pictures and we want to be prepared for everything, but that still doesn't mean that we have to take every tool that we own, um, especially when you get like, as old as Rick or, or even me. Um, we have lots of tools that we've collected over a long period of time that um, we don't necessarily need in the field. And uh, The first time I gave this program was at the Out of Chicago conference a couple of months ago. And I noticed I, I did the, the class on three consecutive days. And the first day, everyone showed up with their backpacks and maybe a rolling camera bag. And this is a street photography conference, right? So everybody's there to literally walk around the streets of Chicago and make pictures. And so everybody had all their stuff. They had their big backpacks and everything else. And that first night, I was uh, part of this. They call it a photo crawl. So I was stationed at one particular place, and people would come shoot where I was and get my advice. And then they would go shoot in another location and get advice from another photographer. And I saw everyone come with their backpacks and their tripods and their rolling cases. And they would make pictures. And then they would go. And I didn't see one person open their backpack, take it off, open their bag, open the tripod, nothing. Everyone just had their favorite camera and their favorite lens. And that's all they carried around. So. The next day of the conference, people showed up, and I didn't see as many rolling bags. I still saw a few backpacks, but not as many rolling bags in my uh, students. Well, the third day, I saw a room full of about 30 or 40 people, all that had a camera with a lens on it in their, in their lap. That was their camera gear. Everything else was back in the room. And they learned over the course of one weekend that, man, I'm not even going to use this junk. Why am I t hauling this around? So that's, kinda, that's more about what this, this program is about. Uh, those people got a lot out of this class, too, uh, because they had, had just lived it. So um, my website is robknightphotography.com, and you can reach me at rob at robknightphotography.com via email anytime you want. So I'm going to give you a little background um, about my shooting. So this was my kit about, gosh, I guess five years ago, five or six years ago. Um, I had a, a Nikon D700. I had graduated to the full frame camera. I was so excited. I had a D200 uh, as my backup. But even this kit, I can see, is pared down from where I started. I started with, uh, I'd see a photographer that made a, an image that I really liked. And I'd say, wow, that's really great. I wonder what equipment he used for that. So I'd feel like I'm, I'd probably be good to have those tools that he had. So I might buy an extra lens, or you know, I might buy a filter, or something like that. So that you know, the bag gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I did that when I was shooting uh, Canon equipment at the time. And then I won't go into why, but I switched to Nikon gear and sold my Canon stuff and bought one Nikon body. And I was going to buy one lens. So I bought just a 50 millimeter f1.4, right? Nice and cheap, nice and versatile. And so I actually used some of the techniques I'm going to go over later in Lightroom to figure out, OK, what lenses do I actually use? Right? What lens do I use the most? on my other system, because that's the first one I'm going to buy for this new kit. And so I determined that I could do just about everything I wanted to do with the 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8. So that was the first lens that I bought. And so I had that. Then I wanted to get something longer, um, bought a less expensive long zoom, ended up with the 70 to 200 28, which uh, you know full frame shooters will know it's the size of a football. And um, you know I wanted a wide angle lens, so I still it's hard not to be, well, you know, I don't have that lens. Let me go ahead and get one of those. Um, and then I would haul all this stuff around and still use the 24 to 70 for most of what I needed. And um, so this is uh, one of the older think tank backpacks they don't make anymore, the Rotation 360 that had the bottom that swings around. It, it's a cool bag, but I had that with an additional holster on the side 
Um, I have one, the little silver camera is uh, converted to infrared, which is cool. I really recommend that. Um, even a light meter. I don't carry a light meter so much anymore. And uh, so, so that was in a big backpack. And I actually had a rolling case that that fit into. It was just such a huge apparatus, probably weighed 30 pounds, you know. Um, so I loved my D700. I, liked, I loved the pictures that it took. I, I liked using it. I, that was just a great camera. Um, and, uh, you know, big cameras are great, right? They make great pictures. I think all these shots were made with my D700. And um, little things like uh, when I knew I needed pro bodies, professional magnesium alloy weather sealed bodies, was when I was taking this picture. Um, and I went to step onto this rock right here, and my foot slipped, and then my hand slipped, and that's why my nose is shaped like this. And my D700 hit the exact same rock at the same time and never even hiccuped. It just worked, and it was fine. It didn't have a scratch on it. So, um, you know, big, nice, robust, professional cameras, they're great, right? Uh, nice, wide, dynamic range. Um, there's no arguing that a full-frame camera is great. And especially at the time, you had to have that to, to make pictures like this. Right, so um, I decided at the beginning of the year that as soon as I sold out my first two workshops of the year, I was going to go. I was going to uh, graduate again and get a D3S, right? Get a big professional camera. And so um, that happened in January, and I was really excited. Like this year is going better than I thought, so I'm going to get this giant camera, and I'm going to be so happy. And I missed my D700 almost immediately because here I have this six-pound camera that again took great pictures, but I just didn't even want to carry it. And I was really bummed out, actually, that now I have this giant camera that I don't even want to use, even though it makes virtually the same pictures I could have made with my D700 that I love so much. So around the same time, uh, I ended up getting a Micro Four Thirds camera. And at the time, it was the, the 12 megapixels was the top end of Micro Four Thirds. And, uh, and it was nice. It, it, it took nice pictures. It was, it was fine. Um, and uh, I went on vacation. With, with only that camera. I thought, well, I'm going to leave my real camera at home, and I'm going to take this little toy camera. And so I put a nice lens on it. It was actually the, uh, the Leica uh, Lumix 25mm f1.4, and took these pictures of my son's first trip to the beach and things like that. And so I came home and looked at these shots, and I thought, these are just as good as what I would have made with my other camera. You know, as long as I'm not trying to shoot at ISO 6400, this thing makes a pretty decent picture. Huh, well that's, that's interesting, but um, I still wasn't really ready to switch by any means. This was my, my snapshot camera, my vacation camera. I still have my real camera for when I'm making real photographs, right? And so um, I didn't really trust it for, for real work. In fact, I was, uh, I was teaching at a thing called the Blue Ridge Photo Festival in Boone, North Carolina around the same time, and I had just gotten the, the new top of the line Micro Four Thirds camera, which was 16 megapixels and better image quality. And um, so I was just going to take that. And, and my wife was along that, on that trip with me. And she said, um, well, you have to take your Nikon. Like, Why do I have to take my Nikon? She said, nobody will take you seriously if you show up to teach a class with that little, little tiny camera. And I, I said, surely. That, she said, no, seriously, it doesn't even look like you're, you know what you're doing because you have this little tiny camera. But okay, so I had my, my big bag with my Nikon stuff, and I just shot with the little camera the whole time. And it was actually the opposite. And everyone had, this was, again, three or four years ago, and people were just starting to hear about mirrorless cameras. So everybody in, in the class was like, is that one of those new mirrorless cameras? Is that any good? Are you getting any, getting any good shots? And so, um, you know, I'm coming away with pictures like this that, again, were, I mean, they work. They're good. They're, there's no... Well, that's pretty good for a small camera or any of that. There was, there was no qualification necessary. They were just, I was making great pictures. And I came back from that trip with more pictures from my little Micro Four Thirds camera than I had that I liked from, by that point, I had a D800E. And I had more pictures with this little tiny camera and more fun shooting because I didn't have all this big stuff to carry around. So um, about five months later, I realized I hadn't taken my Nikon stuff out of the bag. And I thought, well, it's not getting any more valuable sitting here. So I sold all that stuff and bought basically all the lenses that I need to replace that for Micro Four Thirds, and I haven't looked back since. So um, I still have to be careful that I don't drag everything I own out into the field with me. And it's tempting when you get, you know, you get this system that's, um, you know, the lenses are like this is a 
that's a 24 to 70 2 8 lens, right? And when that's your 70 to 200 2 8, then it's easy to think, well, heck, I'll bring my macro and my wide angle lens and my other this, that, and the other. You know, it's easy to fill up, still fill up a bag full of gear. So I still have to be conscious about what I carry and what I need uh, when I'm shooting. So switching systems is not the only way to lighten your load. I started doing this before I, I changed cameras. And uh, the easiest thing is to bring only what you use. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can do that. Um, bringing gear for just in case, for, for just in case scenarios. That's really, especially if you're going on a trip where uh, maybe somewhere you haven't been, or you're going on a long trip. I lead workshops to Costa Rica. So people bring piles and piles of things just in case they need it because they don't know. But sometimes it's as easy as asking your, your trip leader, hey, do I need my fisheye lens? Hey, do you think I'm gonna need this and that? Um, smaller tripods. You can go out, there's a million different tripods now, and it's a matter of finding the balance between sturdiness and size. I basically, I like to use the, the smallest tripod that'll fit into um, my check luggage or I guess the biggest tripod that'll fit into a check luggage, because I like a tall tripod, I'm six foot three, so I like a tall tripod, I can't use one of these little, you know, little spindly ones. I, I like to hold my stuff securely, but I'm gonna throw it in my suitcase and check it, so I don't, I'm not worried about having something that folds up to this size. So it's a matter of finding that balance for you. Of course, I mentioned smaller cameras. Um, and the last one here is something that I've been working on about the last six months to a year, and that's leaving this machine at home. Again, when I'm in, uh, in Costa Rica leading a workshop, I learned a long time ago that people are not there to take a computer class. I, when I first started doing it, we would spend a whole afternoon shut in with the lights off in a situation like this and me talking about Lightroom. And I realized, okay, so I'm taking 15 photographers to this beautiful place that all you wanna do is go outside and make pictures. The people are fantastic, the weather's great, uh, there's, anywhere you look, there's a beautiful picture. And then I'm saying, okay, guys, let's go inside and close all the windows and work on our computers for three hours. It, it just, um, you know, as a, as a tour leader, I don't really want to do that in that situation. So um, most people would rather go out and shoot. And so I'm trying to leave this thing at home as well. And there's a couple of tools that I'm using right now that make that easy. I'm using the iPad Pro, and uh, that's the great big... Uh, great big iPad, it has a really fast processor, and I'm using Lightroom Mobile and mostly Snapseed. This is uh, the uh, Nick software Snapseed, and I believe, is it still free? I guess, I think it's free. Um, and if you've used any of the Nick filters in Light, from Lightroom or Photoshop, it has a lot of the same effects that you would have on there, but you're doing it literally with your fingers. You can make masks. Uh, you can do as many of these layers and tools as you want. It's remarkably powerful. And now I don't load everything into my iPad, right? I have a, uh, it's a My Passport wireless hard drive, okay? And I haven't tried the new one yet because I, I would love to recommend the My Passport wireless hard drive as the greatest thing ever, but it is the slowest machine that I've bought in 10 years. It's, it's heinously slow. But it's a hard drive that has an SD card slot built into it and you attach it, you can interact with it via your computer or an app on, on your Android or your iOS phone. So, in theory, you plug in your SD card, it downloads the, the pictures to the hard drive. It's two terabytes, you have plenty of space. And then the hard drive itself broadcasts Wi-Fi. So then you connect to that Wi-Fi network with your smart device, your uh, iPad, your iPhone, whatever, and you can uh, review your images, you can copy them to your smartphone or your iPad, it's great. In theory, if it, if it all worked as fast as I just said it, that would be great. But the truth is, if you plug in a, a, a CD, an SD card that has 300 images on it, maybe, for, which is not uncommon from a day if you're you know, on a specific photo workshop, it takes sometimes four hours, sometimes five hours to copy them. I, I, I don't even know, like, why would it be that slow in 2016? <laughs> I don't understand. There's a new version that is supposed to be faster in every way. And the other way that it's really, really slow is the Wi-Fi spec. Um, it's like AOL dial-up speed on the Wi-Fi. So it takes forever. You'll, you'll go between images and it'll, you'll, you'll wait 10 seconds for an image to, for the preview to load up. It's remarkably slow. But that, I still use that for backups. 
right? I still, when I get in at the end of the day, I still plug in my SD card and go eat and have a drink afterwards and take a nap and then maybe it'll be finished downloading the pictures. Um, so, because I don't like to just have one copy of an image at the end of the day. And I basically just keep my SD cards as, as one copy and then I back one up to that external hard drive. Okay, so that, that's one thing that I don't need my laptop for. Now, when I'm on the road, um, you know, Rick and I, we're loving things like Snapseed and Lightroom Mobile because um, we can plug in a card reader to the iPad or your iPhone and upload things to Instagram, to Facebook, um, wh wherever, while we're on the road. So, you know, part of our job while we're out teaching is to get people interested so they want to come the next time. So, you know, we're out on Route 66 and, you know, if I'm not driving, I'll fire up the Wi-Fi on my camera and hook it up to my phone and edit the picture in Snapseed and then upload it right there. That's great. So I don't have to wait until I get home, download all the pictures, look at them in Lightroom, do all these editing, uh, the, all the editing. So what I'm not doing is transferring every picture that I have to my iPad, doing all my sorting. I, I'm not doing all that stuff on my iPad. I don't want to take up the hard drive on my iPad to do that. So it's, it's kind of like two different sides of the coin. For my backup, I'm using the wireless hard drive. And then for um, you know, social media and for posting, basically if I want to get some images out there while I'm in the field, then I'm going to use the iPad and Lightroom Mobile and Snapseed. Um, Lightroom Mobile now has um, targeted adjustments and, and a lot of the tools. Every time they update it, they're adding more of the tools that the, the uh, desktop software has. So it's becoming more and more powerful. And uh, you know, things like having Wi-Fi built into your camera, uh, I didn't get that until we, the GX7 Lumix came out and we did a tour uh, to use those. And I thought, well, I'm not going to use Wi-Fi. Just like I was just mentioning, I'm not going to, you know, send all of my pictures to my phone or I'm not going to burn up the battery in my camera to use the Wi-Fi to send the pictures to my, uh, my computer. And I wasn't really thinking about a use case for it. I just, I was thinking, okay, transfer images, I'm not going to use that. Well. Um, I was in Nashville with one of my colleagues, and we we're on Broad Street on the main drag in Nashville, Music City, USA. Every other place is a honky tonk, right? And so here's this pretty girl walking down the street with a guitar case. She's, she looks like a country singer. It's sunset, beautiful light flooding in. I, we said, "Excuse me, we can we take your picture? Like you are, you look like a postcard for Nashville. You know, let's take your picture." Okay, great. So she was super sweet and let us take her picture. And while my buddy was making her picture, I said. Um, thought, well, geez, I'm going to fire up the Wi-Fi on this camera, take my favorite pictures and put them on my phone. And I said, do you have a, uh, an email address to you? She says, yeah. And she gave me her email address. And I said, cool. So I sent her the picture. Like, by the time we were finished having a conversation about it, she had that picture. And five minutes later, she had it as the, um, the background on her Facebook page for her you know, singer-songwriter business. And I'm like, ah, Wi-Fi, camera, got it, OK. So it's not, it's not necessarily a, a replacement for a cord or a card reader. It's you know, a specific thing so that you can share images really easily, and that works great. Um, and now, again, with tools like um, Snapseed, you can basically edit your pictures like you want. I have a couple of um, HDR apps for the iPad that are, that are ridiculously good. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that I've done to try to reduce weight, and that gets five pounds out of my bag. I don't have to worry about that. Unless I'm doing a demo, unless I'm actually using Lightroom, I can leave this at home. So we'll talk about small cameras for a minute. Um, point and shoot cameras have come a long way in the last few years. Um, I've had several conversations with people. Um, I, I do some in-store things. And, and uh, this little old lady in Atlanta came up and said, um, I need to replace this. And she had an ancient point and shoot camera. The screen, the LCD was about this big. It was, I think, two megapixels. It was remarkably old. And I, we said, does that work? And uh, I was with uh, Jack Salmanchuk, and, and we were like, does that work? She said, oh, yeah. You know, I have to charge the battery every couple of hours, but it works great. And um, so, but she can get a million uh, pictures on a card, because it's two megapixels. But, um, and she was looking for the $100 point and shoot camera. Well, she paid $100 for that one you know, eight years ago, so why can't I get a new one? And we had to explain to her that the $100 point and shoot camera is now built into this. Um, so you don't need that. You know, there's no, 
that, that bottom end point and shoot camera has been taken over by cell phones. So the good news is now point and shoot cameras are awesome because they're using technology like 20 megapixel one inch sensors like the FZ1000. This, this picture was made on uh, Lumix bridge camera called the FZ1000. 20 megapixels, um, it's, it's one inch, so it's bigger than a sort of traditional point and shoot sensor. The dynamic range on this is unbelievable. I was moving my office this February and I have a canvas print of that that's 20 by 30. And I was moving it and I, I'm holding the print, literally I'm carrying it. So I'm looking at it and the detail in these leaves and in the moss back here, I, it occurred to me while I was carrying it, like I made this with a really fancy point and shoot camera. Oh my God, I, it's, it's an amazing shot. It's not something where you go, wow, that's really good for a point and shoot camera. It's a fantastic image regardless. So that, that camera in particular has a, a 25 to 400 millimeter Leica lens, f2.8 to f4. So talk about traveling light, that's one camera that does the job of, of everything. And, and it's the size, uh, you know, if you go check one out here, it's the size of a DSLR almost. And somebody was saying, well, yeah, but once you have that camera, then you're, you're the size of a DSLR. And, um, you know, that's the size of my Nikon. And I said, okay, well, put a 25 to 400 millimeter lens on your Nikon and see how big it would be. And he looked at me and said, yeah, well, number one, there's no such thing. And number two, it would be this big. And so there's a lot of advantages to using something like that. This is with the uh, LX100, which is another, it's a point and shoot camera. It actually uses the four-thirds sensor that the micro four-thirds interchangeable lens cameras use, but it's, it's about this big. Do you have one with you? I don't have mine with me. Um, but again, it's basically a fancy point and shoot camera, fixed lens, beautiful Leica lens, uh, f1.4 to f2, I think. Um, and this is, uh, in fact, one of the in-camera filters, which I never thought to use until I got a camera with an electronic viewfinder, because you can turn on these, like this is the grainy black and white filter, and I can see through the lens in grainy black and white. You know, if you're looking through your DSLR, you're looking through the lens. You're looking optically through the lens. So any changes that you make to the processing, you don't see until after you make the picture. So you don't get that same sort of inspiration sometimes from, from the filters in the camera. So um, I've done a lot of work for different resorts in Costa Rica. And this is, uh, this is an HDR shot that I did for a place called Casa Marbella on the Pacific Coast. And this shot is, uh, I did actually, my friend Paul has this uh, rental place that he wanted to put, uh, he needed better pictures. So I have these two images. This one was made, let's see, six years ago with uh, um, D700 with a Nikon full frame camera, okay? This one was made two months ago with an FZ1000 point and shoot camera. So both clients are equally as pleased, and both images are fantastic, although this has, actually has more detail because it's a 20 megapixel image versus 12 on the D700. But the, the reason I wanted to put these in here is the idea that you have to have a 35 millimeter sensor in a camera to have a decent image is just not the case anymore, uh, especially for most people. Most people are shooting in the daytime, in, the, you know, in pretty decent light, and uh, when people start to complain about, well, the, the performance at ISO 6400 is not very good. And for the most part, I, I'm a photographer, so I'm looking for light. And if you're shooting at ISO 6400, there's no light. So I'm not really making a lot of pictures at, at that range. But, um, you know, obviously there's exceptions. But if you can pack a point and shoot camera that does this, you're doing okay. Um, in fact, uh, I was there doing a video project for another resort and my friend Paul just sort of out of the blue, hey man, can you do pictures of my place? And I didn't have anything that wide. I didn't have a, a, a lens for, for my uh, uh, GX8 that was that wide. And so, look, I've got the FC1000. It goes to 24 millimeter equivalent. Okay, so I did the whole thing with the, the uh, FC1000 and it turned out fantastic. And I, I wouldn't have been able to do the job otherwise. So it was great. But it's really hard to beat the the quality and the flexibility, like I mentioned, like I didn't have that lens, but I could have. You know, I have much wider lenses, I have much longer lenses. Uh, just the ability to change basically any aspect of your picture, your image making based on what lens you put in front of the camera, it's, it's hard to beat. Um, whether it's a long lens for wildlife. Now, there are some, the FC1000, like I said, goes to 400 millimeter equivalent. The um, FC300 goes to 600 millimeter, 
600 millimeter equivalent f2.8, which is fantastic. Um, I've had clients in Costa Rica that got shots nobody else got because they were using a bridge camera like that, and they had the 600-2.8, whereas everybody else with their DSLRs would have the 600-2.8, and they just they can't afford it, honestly, and didn't, didn't want to brag, drag it around. You know, you get things like really shallow depth of field a lot more easily the larger the sensor gets. Um, and just dynamic range. This is one raw shot. You know, just that dynamic range from, from highlights to shadows. Um, the, that larger sensor, and this is a, these are Micro Four Thirds cameras, can really give you uh, fantastic image quality. So this is something I've had a million conversations with people about um, over the last, let's see, three years I've been working for uh, Lumix. And, and just in the last year, people have finally realized that mirrorless cameras are a real thing, and they're not some novelty thing. They're not your sort of pocket camera to go with your real camera. Um, and Sony came out with the, the full frame uh, A7s, and you know, they're great cameras, right? And a lot of people have asked me, like, oh, how come you don't use the Sony? Well, the, basically, the body is only part of the equation, right? I carry uh, two cameras, maybe three cameras, depending on what I'm doing, usually two, usually a one and a backup. But I might carry four lenses, six lenses, depend, depending on what I'm doing, you're gonna carry a lot more glass than you are camera. So, for me, the important place to save the weight is in the glass, right? Is in the lenses. And uh, the reason that I got Micro Four Thirds cameras in the first place years ago was because even then, even four years ago, there were more lenses available for Micro Four Thirds than any other mirrorless system. Um, whether it was the Fuji or the Sony or uh, Sony, I guess they had the um, the little, the smaller A series then. Um, what else, the Nikon One. There was a few mirrorless systems out there, but Micro Four Thirds, I could look at the lineup and say, okay, there's my 24 to 70, there's my 70 to 200, there's my 90 millimeter macro. I, I could replace all of my Nikon lenses with, with those, and I couldn't do that with any other system, and it's still pretty much that way. Uh, a lot of systems are catching up, but, um, but the Sony is a small body, right? But it's a full frame sensor. That's a bit, if you're not familiar with it, the Sony um, Alpha series, they have a full frame sensor. So it's a 35 millimeter chip, just like a full frame Canon 5D Mark II or something like that, Mark III now. Um, and the body's very small. They actually made the Mark II versions a little bit bigger because they didn't have much of a grip on them. So if you compare it to, you know, a D750 Nikon with a 24 to 72.8 on it, then it's considerably smaller. Um, I, now I've seen these, uh, I think it's called the G Master lenses in person, and they are enormous. They're about the same size as the 24 to 70. Uh, Nikon, because basically, physically, you can't make a smaller picture or a bigger picture with a smaller lens, right? If you're, you're, the image circle of your lens has to cover a 35 millimeter sensor, then that lens has to be a particular size to, to make that size picture. So, you know, if you compare it to that, it does look a little smaller. Now, keeping in mind the lens starts way back here versus, you know, having to work around the mirror box on the Nikon, but if you compare it to, uh, the GX8, which is this little guy right here, the body is about the same size. The GX8 body is about the same size as the Sony, but this is your 24 to 72 8 equivalent. That's a huge difference to me, right? This lens probably weighs a third what the what the Sony does, um, so I can carry that in one other lens, and I've, I'm using the same space in my bag and the same weight. So um, that's the big difference for me, and that's. Um, that's why I use this smaller system. That's why I went, okay, well, there's a full frame mirrorless. I didn't jump at it because A, I want smaller lenses, and B, I know I can get the image quality out of these that I need to do anything I need to do. Now, if you're shooting at ISO, you know, 6400, 12,000 all the time, then you might want to look into a bigger, a bigger sensor and then just worry about carrying fewer lenses and, um, uh, you know, trying to lighten your load that way. So I mentioned before, okay, so you got smaller lenses, right? But you still don't want to carry the whole world, right? You don't want to carry the universe with you. It's still important to narrow it down. Um, I mean, I have a bag at home that looks kind of like this. And so I have to really think about, okay, what am I actually going to need? What am I actually going to use um, before I pack a bag? Now, it's... It's easier the longer you go, the longer you've been making pictures, right? Then the more you know, 
I'm probably going to make this type of photo. Right? So you can get down the road and understand, well, I don't need to take my, um, my fisheye lens because I never use the fisheye lens. Or I don't, I don't really shoot any macro photography so I can leave that lens at home. Or even if it's as simple as I take more wide angle pictures than I do telephoto pictures, then you might be able to leave your telephoto lens at home and not worry about it. So, so this kit here is basically what I carry now, 24 to 70, 2.8. Um, that's a, I think that's probably 70 to 300, but I have 70 to 200. But now, instead of a big backpack, it fits in this bag right here with all of my battery chargers, uh, my iPad Pro in the back, um, my, my wireless hard drive fits in the front pocket here, and, and I'm cooking. So I, I would say the weight is probably a third of, of what it was with this giant kit. Again, this is, it's hard to tell in this picture, but that's one of those holster bags. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a bag this big. Uh, it's absolutely huge. Um, so if I'm loaded for bear, then I'll take this bag right here. Now, I mentioned with experience, this becomes easier to kind of pare down your, your kit, right? So I've been to Costa Rica a dozen times or more now. I know pretty much, I, I lead a workshop there, so I know where we're going to go. I know pretty much what we're going to encounter subject-wise. But I also know how I shoot, right? And I know the pictures that I want to make. So I don't have to take lenses that are going to cover focal lengths that I'm not going to use, right? So right now, this is my desert island setup. It's the, the GX8 with the, the 15 millimeter Leica. It's a 15 millimeter f1.7. Although this might be replaced by the 12 millimeter f1.4 pretty soon, because that 12 millimeter is outrageous. Um, and just a note, if you're not familiar with it, the Micro Four Thirds system has a two times crop factor. Okay, so a 15 millimeter lens has the same field of view as a 30 millimeter lens on on a full frame system. So a 12 millimeter f1.4 is a 24 millimeter 1.4, then it's like a glass and it's, it's a remarkable lens. I love it. Um, it's not out yet. We don't even have, like I had one to borrow and I had to give it back. But, um, so that and the lens that's on the camera here is the 42.5 millimeter f1.2, also a Leica, um, which is an 85 1.2. And if you've ever shot with that on, a, on any other system, this lens is as pretty as that. It's fantastic. It's super flexible. Um, I actually, when these two lenses came out around the same time, we, uh, I think our, our director asked, okay, which one of these lenses do you want? Which one would you use? And I said, well, I'm, I'm sure I would use the 15 millimeter more than I would use the 42 and a half. I don't really use a portrait lens like that. It's, that 85 millimeter focal length is a traditional uh, portrait focal length. And I said, I don't really do that. Well, um, I've taken probably twice as many shots with the 42 and a half as I have with the 15 because I realized that that medium telephoto is perfect for, um, say, when we go to the uh, Costa Rican Independence Day Parade. It's, it's a great lens for doing sort of environmental portraits at a little longer distance. It works great for that. And that fast aperture of f1.2 helps to really jump the subject out from the background and blur the background easily. But, um, and then this is my new favorite lens, uh, especially for going somewhere like Costa Rica or anywhere else you're going to shoot wildlife. Uh, the 100 to 400. So again, it's the two times crop. That's a 200 to 800 millimeter Leica lens that's image stabilized. Um, and people balk at the f6.3 at the long end, but that's only a third of a stop down from 5.6. So the other thing is, it's about this big. And it's, what is it, 1700 bucks, 1800 bucks? For an 800 millimeter lens, so it's this big. Um, that's the biggest lens I carry, but you know what? It still fits in this bag. Still fits on one side of that, so I can carry all this, all this gear in that little bag. Have my iPad with me, and I've got no rolling case. I've got no backpack. I got nothing. I got this sucker, um, and I do want to talk about this bag. As a matter of fact, this is the um, this is a Tenba Cooper 13 Slim, and the side pockets expand, which is really cool. Basically, it's a camera bag, and it's supposed to be their uh, sort of classier camera bag version. This cotton is supposed to be waterproof, real leather on the bottom. And so it's made for the photographer walking around the streets of New York. You want to look stylish. You want to have a nice bag. I've used this as a saddle bag. I've drug this through the mud and literally just waited till the mud dried and just done like this. Um, I was showing it to some, some of the Timber reps uh, recently and they were like, 
you put this on a horse? And yeah, and they're, so they're like looking for scratches. There's not a mark on this thing. It's awesome. I've had it for, since it came out, maybe a year, probably. And uh, the thing looks brand new. So I can't recommend those, those bags enough. They're great. Um, so uh, I mentioned how flexible this kit is. And I've even used the 100 to 400 almost as a macro lens. Not, not because I'm close to something, but because I can shoot at 800 millimeters and I can stand back here and shoot. Uh, I'm going to show you a slideshow of images that were made just from these three lenses. So, you know, two little primes and, a, and one zoom lens. And, um, and you'll see why I'm not worried about leaving all my other zoom lenses at home. That's that 15 millimeter. It just has such a nice look to it. That's actually with that 42.5 f1.2 lens. So you can see, you can do a lot of different looks just from three lenses. You don't have to have a bag full of gear um, just to do that. Right? Um, one of the things that I send out with uh, my sort of orientation email for my Costa Rica trip is, is basically that, like, you will want these lenses. Beyond that, it's up to, you know, if you are, you love a fisheye lens, by all means, bring your fisheye lens. But, um, you know, I, the, the tour leader will let you know a, a good idea about what you need. So. Um, so how do you get to this point, right? Again, with experience, I've been, I've been shooting seriously for 16, 17 years. So I know what I'm going to shoot. I know what I'm going to use. I know what I'm going to carry. Um, but if you're just starting out or you're, you know, a couple of years into it, it can be really hard to have the confidence to leave things at home because you don't want to be somewhere and be unprepared. So the first thing you want to do is to take your favorite camera, the camera that you use most, if you only have one, that's easy, and then take your favorite lens. All right? If you have one lens that you just love and you love all the pictures that come out of it, and that's just you know, how you see. That's what I like about the 15 millimeter. That's, that's my field of view. So when I hold the camera up, I feel like I'm not even holding the camera. That's my field of view. So that definitely goes in the bag, right? Because you use that all the time. Um, that's the easy part. Also as easy sometimes is going through your bag and taking out all the things that you've never used. I have uh, a friend of mine actually, uh, he's down in Valdosta, Georgia, in South Georgia, and Dave makes a thing called the lightning bug, lightning trigger. And it's so cool. So you strap this thing on your camera, on your hot shoe, and it has, I honestly don't know how it works. You plug it into your uh, remote cable slot, and when lightning flashes, it fires the shutter, and that's how you, you get the shot. Cool, right? Never used it. Dave's awesome. He gave me one. He was like, yeah, try it, man. I'd love to see some pictures. Great. Well, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And if it's thundering, it's raining, right? And there's hills and trees everywhere. It's not like I don't live in Oklahoma where you can see the storm 100 miles away. You know, once you hear the thunder, it's raining already at my house. So I've never used it one time. So I finally, after two years, had to just be OK with the fact that, you know what? I can leave this at home. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna use it. I'm not gonna need it. It's it's a bummer, but it's this big. That's a whole. Heck, I can carry another lens if I take that out, right? So, um, I have a little time lapse controller. You mount it on your tripod. You put it on the camera and, it, and put the camera on it, and it spins. You know, makes makes those nice moving panning time lapse shots. Love it. I've used it one time. Finally, had to just go. You know what? I'm, you know, by the time I get around to setting this thing up, every I'm teaching. I'm, I don't have time for that. 
Um, and I tend to just move more when I shoot than to just sit somewhere and figure out a shot that's gonna take the next 45 minutes. I just don't shoot that way. So I love it, I think it's cool, and the things that I captured with it are great, but I know that I can leave that at home, right? Um, I don't even, I can't even think of any other good examples of things that I'm like, wow, that's super cool. I'm gonna put that in my bag and carry it around for three years and then take it out. But that's the easy part too. You, if you've never used it yet, if it's been in your bag more than a few months and you've been somewhere shooting and you've never used it, just leave it at home, right? So that'll leave you with not your favorite gear, but not the stuff that you've used that you've never used either. So then you can really think about, okay, how often am I gonna use that? Um, maybe it's as simple as thinking about where you're going. Um, Tenba has these little, um, what do they call them? Like, it's a basically a little toolbox, a little padded zipper toolbox with a clear top on them. And I've got one of those with my macro stuff in it. It's got my macro focusing rail, my macro lens, and an LED in it. So it's in one thing. So if I'm gonna go somewhere where I'm gonna shoot macro, I know I'm gonna get, take that. And I don't have to change my whole bag out for it, I just know put that in one of the slots. Great, macro, set. Uh, but I don't take it, you know, I didn't bring it here. I'm not gonna do a lot of macro photography you know, in Manhattan, right? Some people do, but I don't, right? So um, if I see something that's really tiny that I wish I had a macro lens for, eh, it's not the end of the world, it's fine. It's just photography, you know, I just won't make that shot. So. Um, again, it's hard to get to the point sometimes where you have the, the confidence to leave things at home, to, to know that, okay, um, I'm just not going to make that shot. And uh, um, so I had to tell you a story about the, the most gear that I've ever seen in my life on location. Um, it was the first time that I taught a workshop in Costa Rica. And my, in fact, it was my first ever client for a photo workshop. Uh, I met this guy Don in, um, I believe it was the Valley of Fire State Park outside of Las Vegas. And it was right after Photoshop World and I was walking through and I was loaded down. I'm sure I had that backpack from the picture earlier and my tripod and my, you know, looked like I'm going into battle. And well, here comes Don the other way. And so we struck up a conversation and turns out he was, at the time he lived in Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada the middle of nowhere. Like the closest airport to him was five hours away in Calgary. So he lived in the middle of nowhere. And I meet him in the desert in Nevada. <coughs> so gave him my card. I don't even know, but he, he and his, uh, his wife at the time signed up and to go on my Costa Rica trip. First person ever signed up on one of my workshops. And he's the Canadian guy meeting in Arizona, came to Costa Rica anyway. So he shows up and I have to make sure that he watches this when it gets on YouTube because it was hilarious, but he shows up with three giant rolling bags. Three, literally, like full-size suitcase rolling bags with just his camera gear. And I said, man, are you, do you work for National Geographic? I didn't realize that we had a National Geographic photographer. And uh, he's like, well, no, man, I've just got, you know, I just want to be prepared for everything. It's okay. And um, yeah, yeah, I got this. And so he shows the, the like, two-level panorama bracket you know, it's like hundreds of dollars worth of panorama bracket. And I was like, wow, that's cool. You do a lot of panos? Well, no, it said something on the website about we're going to talk about panos. And it's like, okay. I'm like, I don't. He said, you don't have one of these? No, I don't, I don't have one of those. No. But I, I, I usually do them by hand, you know. And uh, so it was kind of like that. Well, don't you have one of these? It was all, these, all this stuff that he bought that he thought might come in handy on this trip. And um, so then the first day, uh, we're going to go out shooting. And he says, uh, okay, what, what lens should I bring? He said, you got three bags worth of gear and you're going you're gonna to bring one lens and you don't even know what it is? And, uh, and so I said, okay, what's your favorite lens? And so he told me, it's probably just 24 to 70. Okay, bring that. Okay. So the next day, well, Rob, where, you know, where are we going today? What lens should I bring? And my, my first question is always, well, what picture do you want to make? That's, that's how you pick which lens. It's not where you're going. It's how, how you want to shoot. And... Um, so I said, okay, what's your least favorite lens? What lens do you use the least? And so it was some, I don't even remember. And they said, okay, we'll just bring that one. Just, just that one? I'm like, yeah, just that one. Well, what if I come across something? I'm like, then you won't be able to make that picture. And then you'll know tomorrow you can bring the other lens or you can just learn how to use this lens that you don't use and maybe you'll like it more. And so we kind of went through his whole bag during the week and um, it was hilarious. So flash forward six years and he came on another trip to Costa Rica and and we've, we've been buddies ever since but he shows up he's got like a backpack and he was really proud to show he's like I only have one backpack and I'm great okay cool 
Um, but um, so he had a, a D4, I guess, an icon, whatever the top of the line. I believe it was the D4 at the time. Professional camera, right? No battery charger. <laughs> so I'm like, well, Don, we've gone too far the other direction, OK? You, you need the battery charger. But fortunately, that Nikon battery is this big, so it lasted him. It lasted him till about Wednesday. But there would be all kinds of good people would just be running to shoot things, and Don would just stand there like, oh, yeah, yeah. like, what are you doing? He's like, I got pictures of that last time. I got to save my shots because he didn't have his battery charger. And I learned that you cannot get a Nikon battery charger in Costa Rica on less than a week's notice. He had to actually stay two or three days longer to, to go get the shipment from customs where it was. So don't do it. It's not, we're not, it's not like Amazon here where somebody will bring it to you this afternoon. It's not like that, you know, uh, or B&H, excuse me. Um, but uh, so I mentioned earlier that when I switched systems and, uh, and started to get uh, new lenses for my, when I switched to Nikon stuff, uh, I used metadata in Lightroom to figure out what lenses I actually use because I'm a big nerd, right? So um, I'm not just going to buy my favorite lens because that might not be the one that I use the most. So um, you can use metadata, and I'm, I, what I'm going to be talking about is in the library module, in the, basically the grid view, at the top of the grid view, you've got the library filter. And if you open Lightroom and you don't see light, library filters at the top, then hit the backslash key, and that will, that will sort of turn that off and on. Um, now, I believe this is the default view, but I'm not sure. I know date is the first column, uh, camera lens. Uh, I'm not sure file type is the default, but you can customize uh, all four of these columns, right? So you can search by any one or all of these criteria at the same time. Okay, so you could say pictures in <laughs> 1903, pictures that you made in 2003 with, uh, you know, the Nikon D300S at, with this lens that are JPEGs. You can, you can narrow it down one by one, use every column if you want to, right? Um, so when I say you can search by anything, I mean really, these, this is your options. And this is just the options in um, the current version of Lightroom CC. So they add stuff to this all the time. Um, now, for example, if you're, I do my sorting with flags and star ratings, so I can search by uh, pick flags. So I can show all my pictures that, my, that I made with my GX8. Uh, in fact, when I was putting this presentation together and I had shots, I wanted to put shots from the uh, LX, uh, FZ1000, I said, okay, pictures that were made with the FZ1000 that have a uh, you know, one star rating. Okay, so that's how I selected my image. I, I can go through my whole catalog at once. I don't have to go to my folders, collections, or any of it um, and, and sort by this kind of thing. So what we're going to talk about now is, is focal length, right? Um, and you can see the different lenses. It, it gets a little confusing in my catalog in particular because I've got um, crop sensor cameras from years ago. I've got full frame cameras. I've got micro four thirds cameras. It gets really weird, but it's pretty easy to decipher when you've got point and shoot cameras because you've got focal lengths like 7.2 millimeters or you know just crazy in between things from these little small lenses. Um, now, I never understood why you'd want something like um, shutter speed, aperture, why, like, why would you want to search for that? Until I did my first, first book for Peach Pit Press, and it was about the GX7. And so I had to show images that were made at a thousandth of a second. Oh, OK. Well, let me look at you know, images that had pick flags on them that were made at a thousandth of a second. Oh, OK. I get it. Cool. Um, it's just you know, once you have that use case, then all this makes perfect sense. So we're going to start with the focal length. And again, the problem comes in, you know, 35 millimeters on this is a 70 millimeter field of view on a full frame camera. So you kind of have to go through one and then the other, right? Um, <laughs> some patterns are pretty easy to spot, right? Again, 34.91, with zoom lenses, you get some crazy uh, settings. But you can tell that 35 millimeters down, you know, you have 6,000 pictures, right? Um, I've made quite a few images at that particular focal length. And um, now I know from, from my own, just knowing how I work a lens, I, if I've got my 12 to uh, 35 on, which is a 70 to 200 equivalent, I usually am either as wide as it goes or as tight as it goes. And I'm the same with my 35 to 100. That's, that's just how I do. I don't usually sort of dial in. I, I know that, okay, I want a wider shot, so I'll do that. 
or I want a tighter shot, so I'll do that. Um, that's why there's not many, not as many in between. I'm, I'm at one end or the other of that lens. So, the, uh, you know, then you go into which lenses that you're using for that. Um, and it's, especially when it comes to different um, camera systems, then it's easy to decipher, okay, obviously the ones that I made with the 16 to 35, um, I use that lens a lot too, right? But that's, on, that's a full frame Nikon lens, so that doesn't really apply. So if I'm applying that to what I want to do for micro four thirds, then that's at the 70 millimeter range. So that's a whole different animal, that's a little longer. Does that make sense? Everybody follow me there? Um, you have to sort of, and most people aren't going to have this trouble. Um, but once it gets into 15 millimeters, that's an easy one, right, for me. I, again, I love that focal length. I use that all the time. So um, now I can look and see, okay, the 12 to 35, which is this guy right here. It's a zoom lens, very flexible. Even with the 12 to 35, I've shot that particular focal length 600 times. So that's a sweet spot for me. That, that is definitely a point on, even on the zoom lens, it's not as wide as it goes or as tight as it goes, but that's a range that I use a lot, even with this lens. But most often I'm using the 15 millimeter f1.7. So what that means is, if I bring this 15 millimeter lens, I can compare that to 12 millimeters, 14 millimeters, the wider range on the zoom lens. And I've made way more pictures with this than I have even at the wider end of that, that zoom lens. So I can bring this little bitty lens, right? And even though this one's small, it's not as small as this. It's twice the size of this. So I can bring this and still make all the same pictures that I would make normally. So now I can look if I, you know, depending on how nerdy you want to get with it, I can look at the 30 millimeter focal length and then start looking at my full frame lenses and see what that, you know, to sort of compare the two systems. But um, the fact is normally you're gonna have that those, these sort of all or nothing numbers. If you look down the list, you'll say, okay, that one's 5,000 pictures, this one's 20. That's, that's a big difference. Even if you just look at the, the lenses themselves. Um, so, you know, once you get a few pictures in your catalog, or and you can do this in the bridge too, um, then it's easy to spot those patterns and kind of, um, you know, figure out what lenses you can leave at home. The, um, like the 14 to 140, eh, I use it some. Uh, the 12 to 32, that's actually a, a kit lens, and I've used that hardly at all, right? Um, and again, this is, um, if you want to get even, uh, dive in more with that, then change one of the columns to star ratings or pick flags or however you find your favorite shots. So now you're going to look at what, what, how many of your favorite pictures have you made with each lens, not just how many pictures, because maybe you made a million pictures with one lens and you have four that you like, right? Maybe you're just trying it out. Um, so um, that's an easy way to figure out what glass that you take. And that's, that's one of the ways that I came down to taking the 15 millimeter and the 42.5 and the 100 to 400. I know if I have a moderate wide angle, medium telephoto and that long lens, I can shoot everything I'm gonna shoot in Costa Rica. And um, you know, now when I go, when Rick and I go uh, to Route 66 in October, that's gonna be different. I'm not gonna need that long telephoto. There's not, I'm not gonna be shooting wildlife there. Uh, I'm not going to be shooting surfers there, that kind of thing. So um, I might take something wider instead of that longer lens, right? So I might take my sort of um, 15 millimeter walk around lens, that 85.12, I always take that anyway, and then maybe the 7 to 14 f1, f4, which is a 14 to 28, so a nice wide angle lens because we're on Route 66 and we're you know get big sweeping vistas and uh, the clouds in the sky that time of year out in Arizona are, are amazing. So. Again, the more experience you have um, going and shooting, the better, right? The, the more that you can dial in and say, okay, um, again, I'm probably not gonna take my macro lens at Route 66 um, because I know we're not gonna specifically be doing that. It's also easier for me because I'm driving the boat, right? I'm, I'm taking people to go shoot stuff. So I'm not taking, if, if I'm not taking you to shoot macro, chances are you're not gonna do that. And I'm certainly not gonna be doing that as a demonstration. So um, it becomes easier, but, um, the, uh, basically the trick to all this is that the less gear you carry that you don't, you're not using, the better, right? The, the better your travel experience, the better your travel pictures are gonna be. Um, 
Rick, Rick and I are kind of the same in that, that we shoot on the road. Uh, if you're, in, you're shooting in the studio or you're working out of your car all the time, by all means, take every piece of gear that you have and, and then you know, the one time that you need it, you'll be glad. Uh, but the opposite way to approach that is kind of a minimalist approach is that you know, if I see something then I think, man, that would make an amazing picture if I had this other piece of gear that I don't have. I'm, I'm just okay with that. It's, it's uh, hard as a photographer a lot of times to be okay with just seeing things and not, and not feeling bad because you don't capture every single shot. Um, and uh, I'm kind of, I, in fact, I was telling a friend of mine the other day, we were shooting, we were doing some macro photography in North Georgia. And I saw, I don't remember what exactly it was, it was the way the light was, and I didn't have a wide angle lens with me. And I said, man, I, I really, that's a beautiful shot. And she said, well, you're not gonna take a picture? I don't have my wide angle lens. And she was like, oh, that's, that sucks. I'm like, you know what, it, it's okay. I'm still here, I can still see it, I can still enjoy it. And the fact that I don't capture it is not, doesn't take away from the experience for me. You know, the fact that I can't show, I still have the memory of it. Um, and, and it's hard as photographers, we get so, like I gotta get every shot, and. Um, to get past that point is uh, it's kind of relaxing, really, to go and shoot. Um, and maybe that in itself makes it easier to not bring every piece of gear that you, that you have. Um, I mean, you should definitely go outside and buy every piece of gear that, that they have. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, be specific about it and think about the images that you want to make. You know, and if, uh, you know, if you're wrestling with things that, well, you know, I have this in my bag and I really like this thing that it does, well then, my advice is anytime you get a new lens or a new camera or a new whatever it is, only use that. Make yourself use that. Um, if I, when we get new cameras to try out for you know, the Lumix team or new lenses, um, I'll go on trips, I, I guess it was the uh, Out of Chicago conference. I took the GX85, it's a new, new model. Um, I love the GX8. This is my daily driver, and you can tell by looking at it up close. Uh, it's all beat up, but um, and we got the GX85, and I just hadn't used it that much. So when I went to Chicago to do the street photography conference, that's all I took. Took the GX85 and two smaller lenses that that are sort of matched. That's a little bit smaller body than this, and uh, and that was it. And you know what? That's what I used, and I figured out things that it does really well that I that I like. That in fact stuff that the GX8 doesn't have. Some bells and whistles that it has. Um, so. That actually helps a lot. So if you, you know, if you get a new lens and you find you're not using it, then go out and leave your other lenses at home. You know, make yourself use it, and maybe you'll figure out ways to use that lens, you know, whatever piece of equipment that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. You know, a lot of times, especially the more specialized the tool is, the more you only think about it one way. But if you just take it out and say, I'm going to use this for every picture I make for a week, then you know, you'll figure out stuff that it does that that you hadn't even thought about. So. Um, the um, I lost my train of thought. The uh, there's there's a lot of stuff that these cameras do that I never thought about with DSLR cameras. And I mentioned using the filters um, with the electronic viewfinder and things like that. And those tools I didn't really figure out until that until I started leaving my full frame stuff at home, leaving my DSLRs at home. Um, and kind of instead of saying, oh, geez, this is different than what I'm used to, I just made myself use it until this is what I'm used to, and, and now I like it so much better. So release you into the wild. Hopefully you'll come tomorrow. Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.